the last things we may think that by standing on someone else's shoulders we are taller actually we're all equal at least in our constitution and in that equality we can be sure that we all stand without in any way illusion or escape one day before the penetrating gaze of the one who at one point in time said be just as we see in the fingers barely touching in the Sistine Chapel. We start on our journey ignited in a night but we must come back and come back we will no matter how much noise and how much limelight no matter how much attention we draw to ourselves on our journey but we come back equal as we started in that context I'd like to pause with you at that point remember we can't escape it To help, I'll take one or two passages that I came across this morning as I was preparing from the Purgatory Manuscript because they are little lights on the beyond and they help us to see what is awaiting us. How far is it from the world in which we live in Purgatory? She's asking this question, this nun who's alive, where is it? this place of purification. Purgatory is in the centre of the globe. You know that one day the devil, actually there was a number of them, were told by an exorcist to go to the place created for them. And they immediately corrected him from inside the possessed person God did not create that we did. So it's not a good place to be. Bad company. It's as far away as they can get from the one that they have refused. But the difference is that they had full knowledge and it couldn't be reversed. As long as we have one moment of lucid time, we can reverse it. The question of the way in which souls behave there is gone into, how much do they know of what's going on here, if people remember them and so on. The question of how can they suffer when they're only immaterial. And yet, it's true. It's the only truth at that point. And then this question that I have to pause over for a few seconds, the moment the moment of truth. Tell me what takes place during the last agony. The word agony is a Greek word, agonia, it means a fight. That's what they did in the athletic world. And in the time that follows, does the soul find itself in the light or in darkness? Under what form is the sentence pronounced? Sentencia, it's what a judge pronounces. The answer comes back that this particular soul had no agony, it was a sudden death. <coughs> goes on to the different kinds of deaths that are around there. Some people have a tremendous battle, and some are spared out of a divine mercy. God anticipates that and takes them. But then there are consolations for those who have had a special devotion to a saint. I've had to do actually with a person, a close friend of mine who has gone not long ago into the beyond, but a great devotion, a great devotion to St. Joseph. And you know what? St. Joseph came for him. He had a very dramatic death, and Joseph was around palpably and visibly.
God doesn't allow a soul who has been faithful to him throughout her life to be lost in these final moments. Those who have loved the Blessed Virgin, remember in the Ave Maria, we say it all the time, ora mortis, who have invoked her all through their lives, received many graces from her during the last struggles. The same is true for those who have been devoted to St. Joseph. If there's a St. Joseph around, we can be sure that he is pretty close to the Blessed Virgin and that those who invoke him and have a special devotion to him are specially protected. And those who have his name have a special favour because he looks after his own and bear his name in a special way. St. Michael, so anyone who has a special devotion to St. Michael at that point has a fringe benefit or some other saint. It is then, as I have said to you already, that one is glad to have an intercessor before God in this painful moment. There are souls who die in peace without experiencing anything of what I have just described. The good Lord has his designs in everything. He does or permits everything for the particular good of each. Now, in the writings of St. which is not St. Officially, but she's considered blessed, Julian of Norwich, we have this message from the Lord, that the Lord in his providence is guiding things <coughs> and permitting things for our good. So we need to be in a certain peaceful mode to receive this message from the Lord. Lord, what are you telling me through this event that you are allowing to happen now for my good? How am I to tell you and describe to you what takes place after the agony? It isn't possible to understand it properly without having gone through it. And that comes to also another explanation of what's going on on the other side, what time is like out there. We just can't understand it until we get there. I'll try, nevertheless, to explain it to you as best I can. The soul, as it leaves its body, has a feeling of being utterly bewildered. In the old Ireland, I heard that there was this tradition in families in the country to open a window at the death of a person. Did you hear about that? The soul, therefore, as it leaves its body, has a feeling of being utterly bewildered, completely besieged. I think the French was envahi, invaded, if I may so speak, by God. It finds itself in such lucidity, in the twinkling of an eye, it perceives its whole life. And something of that can happen if you're in an accident. If you're suddenly confronted with what you think may be death, you suddenly have a flash. This is it. I'm already. So, it perceives its whole life, and in accordance with what it sees, what it deserves. It's the soul itself. But in the midst of such a clear sight, <coughs> pronounces its own sentence. Now that applies in the realm of purgatory and the other. It does not see God, that would be already a beatific vision, but he is annihilated by his presence. It is a guilty soul as was my own case, and in consequence is merited purgatory. It is so crushed down by the weight of its faults, still remaining to be effaced, that it plunges itself of its own accord into purgatory. It is then, and then only, one understands God. You know why, don't you? There's no more distraction. At that point, the soul is no longer depending on the body and the senses to perceive. A blind person who's always been blind 
for the first time sees a death because it doesn't depend anymore on the eyes. It is then, and only then, that one understands God, his love for souls, and how wretched sin is in the eyes of his divine majesty. St. Michael is there when the soul leaves the body. Hence we have these scales usually in his hands. It is him alone that I saw, and that all souls see. He is, as it were, the witness and the executioner of divine justice. I also saw my guardian angel. We forget him, don't we? And yet he's our best friend, the invisible one that we don't invoke. We must invoke him a lot. One day we'll see him. And the more we invoke him, the more he's active. He can go around and talk to other angels. And you looking for a husband or a wife, remember that. You can send your angels scouting around to talk to other guardian angels. Find me a man. Find me a woman. Or find me a lost object. It's the same. They can see. All this is to help you to understand how it is and he said, St. Michael's carries our souls to purgatory. Because a soul can't be carried. Yet nonetheless, it's true, as much as he is there, present at the execution of the sentence. All that goes on in the other world is a mystery for yours. Then the difference between a particular judgment and the general judgment. At the particular judgment, it's as it were a private affair. No one else knows what's going on. On the last day, the Lord in his providence and justice will allow that we will see the impact of our sins and our merits on other souls. Because it's not just a private affair, our salvation. We can have repercussions in what we do, for better or for worse. And sometimes we have the right to know certain things. There's perfect justice in eternity, at the end of time. Are people's faults known to everyone in purgatory, as they will be at the last judgment? Generally speaking, we don't know the faults of others in purgatory, except that is when God permits it with regard to certain souls, for his own designs. But it's only with a small number of souls that he acts in this way. Now this bit concerns us all, the consequences. Do we realise the value of a day? If this were your last, would you be ready? If someone were to tell you today, this night you will not wake up, what would you do? It goes into the degree of purity required to be admitted to the Divine Presence and the Beatific Vision. Alas, if people only reflected on these things while yet on earth, says the souls in purgatory, what on earth they would lead. Examine seriously how many venial sins, just a bit of swearing, just a bit of bad temper, a bit of impurity, just a little bit of sin, commits in one day. How many minutes does he give to God? Does he as much as think of him with reflection? Think hard, says the soul. Contemplate 365 days of this kind in one year. And if a large number of years follow the same pattern, this person dies with a soul loaded with a multitude of venial sins, which heaven would have not been effaced. Just enough barely to get there. Then, of course, the others who have more, just too much more. And this is where, of course, the Hell Manuscript goes into and ends precisely with the same. The soul itself pronounces the sentence and can't go towards God, has to flee. And can't repent either because it's stuck and frozen in its will at the moment of death. Be ashamed! 
It's a mystery, but they can't come back over that last refusal of grace. And yet, neither could I resist under the eyes of God, whom I had rejected. One thing alone was left. Escape! As Cain ran away from the corpse of his brother Abel, even so was my soul repelled outside, far away from this horrid sight. It was the particular judgment. The invisible judge was saying, depart from me. I conclude, my friends, all the time, souls are going into that experience, two per second, roughly, all the time, all the time. Many different forms of death. Right now, there are many in the war situation, not really being able to be prepared. You just think you're in a battle. What do you do? You try to survive, survive, survive. And suddenly your body is gone and you run into a key encounter that you didn't have time to think about. So many car accidents. So many, of course, losing lucidity under morphine. And then those who take their own life unnecessarily. But all having this one common experience, departing from the distraction of the body and facing the truth. The one truth, the only truth that in the end mattered. My friends, if it's a bullet, it's the same. If it's cancer, it's the same. It's landing. Where and how will we land when that intersection comes?